Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome to Lahem Panim. If you've been following the show, you'll know that we have come to chapter 17 of our study of the book of Acts, a chapter in which we find Paul and Silas coming to the city of Thessalonica to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the people there. And so Paul begins, as was his custom, in the synagogue. And it says in verse 2 and following, And for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And so right away we see that Paul begins to witness to a large crowd of unbelievers. Now I'm going to be painfully honest with you today. Um, Even as a pastor, I still find it incredibly difficult to witness to non-believers. I don't have a problem sharing the gospel with believers, which I do every single week. But every time that I've had to preach before an unbelieving crowd, which of course I had to do when I was involved in prison ministry. I was always, and I mean always, reluctant to do it. In fact, one week I remember I decided to skip the ministry that week, and the leader of our group called me and said, where are you? And I told him that I didn't think I was going to be able to make it that week. And he told me, Cameron, you need to be there. And so somewhat embarrassed, I went, and I was glad that I did as I usually was afterwards. And you know, from then on out, I didn't dare to skip. But what I learned from that, and I think I'm still learning, is that no matter how hard it is, you and I, we need to remain faithful to share the gospel. Because Jesus doesn't ask us to. No, he commands us to. If you and I, if we claim to be disciples of Jesus Christ, then his great commission applies to us. You know, it's amazing to me how often we talk about sins that we need to avoid committing. But we often fail to talk about sins of omission, things we should have done but didn't. And witnessing, I think, is one of those Sins of omission for me, because I've done it, and when the Lord has led me, I've tried to be faithful, but every time I find it difficult. And I know that I'm not doing it nearly as much as I ought to. Now, I wonder what you and I are worried about. Why is witnessing so difficult? Well, I think it's intimidating, for one thing. Statistics say that the number one fear, even more than the fear of death, is the fear of public speaking. Jerry Seinfeld, he made the hilarious observation that what this actually means is that at a funeral, you and I would rather be the person in the casket than the person giving the eulogy. I don't know. Maybe sometimes that's the case. But you know, I also think that you and I are more than just being afraid of crowds. We are also afraid, and we definitely see this in individual evangelism as well, that will somehow do a bad job, that will say something wrong or make people's spiritual conditions somehow worse. And so we say, we better leave that to the experts. But you know, God doesn't ask us to do it well. Now, he often does want us to prepare for it as best we can, but he doesn't say you have to do it right or don't do it at all. No. What does he say? Jesus says in Mark 13, 11, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, every single time that I have been willing to step out and be that voice for God, God has shown up and he has spoken through me. I remember one week we showed up at the prison and I preached, probably pathetically, and none of the prisoners seemed to be listening. All of them were involved in other things. But as I turned to leave, 
feeling the pangs of discouragement kind of wash over me, one of the guards beckoned me to a prisoner that I had not even seen, didn't even know he was listening, who was still locked up in his cell. And he was asking for me. And I came over and he stuck his fingers out through the bottom of the door. And he wanted me to hold those fingers, to hold his hand and pray with him to receive Jesus Christ. And so I prostrated myself on the floor and I held his hand tightly. And there and then he gave his life to Christ. What if I had not showed up that night? What if I had said to Jesus, I'm sorry, I just don't feel equipped enough? A soul may have been lost for the kingdom of God. Now, sometimes you and I, we simply don't know where to start. Well, Paul, in his sermon here in the synagogue, here in Thessalonica, I think he offers us a clue because the first thing that we see him do is he tells his listeners very simply what the word of God says. And you know, that's the secret of all great preaching. Not eloquence, not speaking ability, but being willing to simply get out of the way and let the word of God be spoken by him to people through you. That's what Paul always did. Now notice how he anchors his arguments in what God has revealed in and through his word, the very word that these Jews revered. You see, he begins with what they knew, which is where you and I also need to start when we minister to others. It's always a good idea to begin with whatever truth somebody does know. Find that common ground. And then move steadily, slowly from that common ground, from what they know to what they don't know. Paul knew that they were expecting the Messiah, the Christ to come, though they were expecting him to be this great military figure who would come and deliver them from all physical oppression, particularly Rome. And eventually Rome would fall. But God knew that that would not solve their primary issue, which wasn't external bondage, but internal bondage. And that's why Paul moves from what they know about the Messiah to what they don't know explaining to them, using the scriptures, how before the Messiah could deliver them physically, he had to first deliver them spiritually. He had to first suffer, die, and be raised again in order to deal with the root of our true problem, which is the problem of sin. Now, it's interesting Luke doesn't tell us what scriptures he used, though he no doubt referenced those verses that foreshadowed Christ's death. Um, things like uh, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. Um, he may have referenced Psalm 16, which shows that the Messiah would one day rise from the dead. But whatever scriptures he used, he pulls them all together to show that without a doubt, Jesus is the Christ. The Messiah so clearly prophesied about in the Old Testament. Now it says in verse 4 and following, And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, they set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. By the way, it's so interesting to me. Notice how they never try to refute Paul and Silas's theology. They don't respond with logical counter arguments. And that's because they were jealous of Paul and Silas. And that jealousy was really what was motivating them, not a desire to keep doctrinally pure. No, it was all about jealousy. Paul and Silas stealing the limelight away from them. And that's what we also will find when we share the gospel. Sometimes people will scoff at us 
might even begin maligning us, not because they disagree with us and can prove us wrong, but because they're jealous or they're threatened by the truth of what we're saying. And that's what we see was driving this mob. Here we see they begin searching for Paul and Silas in the house of a man by the name of Jason. Now, we don't know that much about Jason. He's one of the unsung heroes of Scripture. Jason was a very common name for Jewish men living in the diaspora. And Paul and Silas were apparently staying in his home. And that's where the mob comes looking for them. And interestingly, Jason, he takes the heat for Paul and Silas because it says, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying there is another king, Jesus. Now, the reason that they say this is because they knew that the Romans were not going to care one whit about any theological disagreement between them and these preachers, Paul and Silas. However, they would care about treason, which was a very serious crime in the Roman Empire. And so that is what Paul and Silas are accused of as their allegiance to Jesus, whom they claimed was a king, and of course he is, though we know he's a very different kind of king, and they knew that as well. They knew what Paul and Silas was talking about, but they purposefully twist their words and skew the meaning. But they knew that that would sound very suspicious to the Romans, and that's what people do to you and me as well. They skew the truth in whatever way suits their fancy, in order to make us look bad. I'm sorry to say it, but for the rest of time, Christians like you and me are going to get labeled with words like bigot, intolerant, anti-progress, narrow-minded, even worse, close-minded. And we just need to recognize that that's par for the course. If you and I follow Jesus who has wrongfully accused himself with the same accusation that we see here being leveled against Paul and Silas, we also ought not to expect any less. Now, these accusations, they serve to poison many against Paul and Silas. It says in verse 8 and following, And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security, or bond, from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And so Jason, he posted bond. He puts up cash for freedom. Now, by doing that, he was promising that the trouble would cease, or his own property, and possibly his own life, would be taken. But since that bond would be forfeited if there was any more trouble, Paul and his companions had no choice but to leave. And so they flee from Thessalonica because of this Jewish opposition. However, I don't want you to think for one minute that the ministry in Thessalonica was dead. No, the church there was actually thriving and growing. In fact, two of its members, Aristarchus and Secundus, they actually joined Paul in his evangelistic work. We see that in Acts 20 verse 4. And Paul commended all the church members in 1 Thessalonians 1.8, because he says, the word of the Lord had sounded forth from them, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place their faith toward God had gone forth. The Thessalonians, in fact, used their strategic location on the Ignatian Way to spread the gospel far beyond their own city of Thessalonica. Nevertheless, because of that opposition, Paul and Silas, they had to flee the city. And it says, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And next week we'll see what God does through Paul and Silas while they are there in Berea. But this week, I want to encourage you to get out there. Begin sharing your faith. Start those conversations. Find out what truths people believe um, that you can identify with, that you can find common ground with. 
and then build on those beliefs and eventually connect them with the person of Jesus Christ. Don't worry about how well equipped you are. God himself will equip you as you step out in faith and trust and obedience to him. Let's do so this week. Amen. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word, and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.